Hi, I'm Jennifer, an MCAT teacher and content creator here at Kaplan. In this video, Avery, one of our expert instructors, will take you through what we've identified as one of the toughest passages from Kaplan's free MCAT practice test. This test was designed by Kaplan's question writers and validated by Kaplan's psychometrics team to be as representative of the actual MCAT as possible, so you know you're getting a great representation of what you will see on test day. This passage from the Chem Phys section focuses on a chemical reaction and its kinetics. Follow along as Ari attacks this passage using Kaplan's passage and question strategy. My initial preview of the passage shows me that the topic is about smog. Interesting, but not something that brings any specific MCAT content to mind. I also see a whole list of compounds, particularly notable in that they all seem to have oxygens in them. The latter half of the passage has a reaction and reaction profile graph and a description at the bottom that seems to describe the reaction in more detail. I've seen reaction profiles before in my studies, and given the relative simplicity of the first two paragraphs, I'm going to do a fairly quick analysis using Kaplan's highlighting method for this passage. There's a fair amount of background information in this first paragraph. While it provides some justification for focusing on smog, none of the details about air pollution or human health effects seems particularly key for MCAT questions. The one thing that might come up in a question is the second sentence, how the smog can react with sun to create photochemical smog, so I'll highlight that term to help guide me back to this paragraph if I need more details. This detail stands out because I know the rest of the passage talks about some chemical reaction occurring. Paragraph 2 picks up the theme with photochemical smog and gives an example of compounds. I think the key thing here is that they are reactive and oxidizing, which is why I'm going to highlight this phrase instead of the giant laundry list of compounds that follows. The next bit refers to the diagram and reaction I saw towards the end, which I'm told is catalyzed by those photochemical smog compounds. However, I'll need to keep in mind that the reaction and diagram are under standard conditions. Nothing really stands out to me for the reaction one, but the reaction profile seems interesting. The first thing I always do is to take a look at the axes. There's progress of reaction along the x-axis and potential energy along the y-axis. There are numbers on the graph which I think are likely to appear in a question. I also note the two humps in the graph, which I know from my studies corresponds to two high energy transition states and one slightly lower energy intermediate between the humps, which seems to align with the fact that the reaction proceeds through two steps. I also note that the first step is slow, which means that it's a rate limiting step. Finally, I'm told that the reaction is spontaneous, which I'll highlight here for easy reference. With that relatively brief analysis, I'm going to head to the questions. I know that I'll probably need to dig more into the passage, particularly this latter part of the graph, but I want to wait for the questions to analyze it in more detail. I always start my view of science questions by taking a look at the patterns in the answer choices. In question one, I see that each of the answers have a set of numbers referring to figure one. Reading more closely into the question stem, it's asking what values in figure one are changed in the presence of a catalyst. Before I take a look at the figure, I'm going to take a moment to recall what I know about catalysts. First, I know that they speed up the rate of the reaction by lowering the activation energy. Second, they don't affect the thermodynamics of the reaction. That is, they don't affect the energy levels of the reactant or product, just the path going from the reactant to the product. Finally, I know that they're not consumed by the reaction. Now I'm going to take a look at the figure. From my content background, I know that the start of the graph is going to represent the energy level of the reactant, and the end is going to be the energy level of the product. I recall from my earlier distillation of the passage that the figure showed two humps, and I know from my studies that the activation energy is going to be the energy I need to add into the system to get the reaction going, so the difference in energy from the reactant to the transition state. Since there's two humps, there's two activation energies, one here going from reactant to the first transition state, and the second one going from the intermediate to the second transition state. Since both of those activation energies overlap with energy values 1 and 2 from the graph, 
That's all I'll need to select answer choice B. The catalyst will lower the activation energy values. Even though energy value 2 is spanning something that doesn't actually represent the activation energy for the second intermediate, how high that peak goes will still be affected in the presence of a catalyst. C is incorrect because energy value 3 represents the energy of the reactant, and I know that catalysts don't affect that value. Energy value 5 is a difference in free energy of the reactant and product, and while this value will tell me about the spontaneity of the system, that will not be affected by a catalyst. And finally, in answer choice D, the energy value 4 is unaffected by the presence of a catalyst since that is the energy of the product. Glancing through question 2, there are two things that immediately stand out to me. The answer choices all talk about collisions between A and B, and the big old cannot in the question stem. I used to rephrase these questions to target the answer that doesn't fulfill the question, but honestly, I kept forgetting to choose the not answer, so I found that rephrasing this to eliminate what does work much better for me. For this question, I'll rephrase it so that I eliminate the possible collisions for the rate determining step. I remember from my passage analysis that there is a reaction with A and B, so that I know this is passage based, and before I do any more in-depth analysis, I'm going to apply a bit of content knowledge here. First, I know that when I'm considering the rate of the reaction, only the reactants count since we're considering the initial rate of the reaction, when the product doesn't yet exist, which is why all answer choices involve A and or B. Second, I know that I need to presume that all reactions provided are net reactions unless otherwise stated. In fact, I actually know that has to be true. Paragraph 3 tells me that the reaction proceeds via two steps, so the sum of those two steps will equal to the reaction I see in the passage. There are a few additional key facts from the passage. The first step of this reaction is slower than the second step, and that's key because the slowest step in the reaction will be the rate determining. The rate of this slow step will determine how fast the overall reaction will proceed, which is why it's called rate determining. The second key fact is that the rate determining first step follows second order kinetics. I recall from my studies that these individual steps, also known as elementary steps, have only three variations. I can have a first order reaction where there's only one reactant involved. I always remember SN1 reactions in orgo as a good example of a first order reaction. You can also have two of the same reactants, and since there are two reactants, that's a second order reaction. And finally, you can have two different reactants, but just like the one above, two things equal to second order. Since the passage tells me that it's second order, the first option's out, but I'm not sure if it's two of the same reactants or two different ones. I don't know much more than that, so I'm going to have to take a look at the answers and remember to eliminate the possibilities. A says that a molecule of A reacts with a molecule of B. That's two different reactants, so possible. I'm going to rule out answer choice A. B says a molecule of A collides with another of A. That's two of the same reactants, so eliminate answer choice B. C says that it's a molecule of B colliding with another molecule of B. Now, that's interesting. I suppose that's possible, but looking at the reaction, the stoichiometry has two A's reacting with one of B. However, I have to remember that this is the net reaction. I guess it's possible that one of the B's eventually cancel out in one of the other steps. In any case, it's a little bizarre, so I'm going to leave it and look at D. D has two molecules of A colliding with a molecule of B, and that can't work. I know that it would mean it's third order, and that's not an elementary step. In fact, that represents the stoichiometry of the net reaction, and if it all happened at once, why bother with the second step? D is impossible, and therefore is going to be my correct answer. When I look over question 3, the first thing that stands out to me is all of the terms. KEQ, delta G, endothermic, and potential energy. All of these are principles in thermodynamics. The question stem is very devoid of clues. It simply asks what is true based on the passage. So rephrased, 
It's asking which thermodynamic principle is true based on the passage information. There was something I highlighted in paragraph three that I think is worth jumping to right away. I had highlighted that the reaction was spontaneous, and there's a few important implications from that statement. First, I recall that spontaneous processes have a free energy change, also known as Gibbs or delta G, that is negative. It means that it's a spontaneous reaction that has reactants with comparatively high energy and products with lower energy. Since the reaction is decreasing in energy as it goes from reactant to product, the Gibbs value is negative. From that, I can eliminate answer choice B. Second, I know that KEQ is an equilibrium constant that represents a proportion of products over reactants. For a spontaneous process at equilibrium, there will be more products than reactants. That would mean the numerator is bigger than the denominator, which means that KEQ must be greater than one, matching to answer choice A. On test day, pick it and quit it. In review, it's worth exploring the other answer choices. C is incorrect because I can't make any claims about the heat of the reaction. Endothermic means that heat is added to the reaction, but there's no mention about whether heat is used or produced. D is interesting. It states that the potential energy of A is greater than the potential energy of D. While it is true that A and B are both on the reactant side, and C and D are on the product side, and that the reactants do have a higher potential energy than the products, I have to remember that I don't actually know but the individual potential energies of each of the reactants and products. The passage did say this happened in two steps, and I don't know which reactant might actually start off the whole reaction, so while it might be true, it's not necessarily true, and therefore cannot be our correct answer. Looking at question four, I first notice the pairs of numbers in the answer choices, all of them either two or four, and the reaction in the question stem. I also notice it's a pseudo discrete question. It's passage associated, but doesn't require passage information to answer. There's a reaction provided in the question stem, and I would rephrase this as asking what the oxidation number is of carbon in the reactant and in the product. The fact that this is providing information about ozone and its oxidation potential isn't useful information. Before I examine the reaction more closely, I'm going to recall some fact about determining oxidation number. I know there's a number of ways to do this, but the easiest from my perspective is to simply use my knowledge of electronegative trends of atoms. If that carbon is bonded to something more electronegative, it then loses that negative electron, so the oxidation number increases. If that carbon is bonded to something less electronegative, it then gains that negative electron and the oxidation number decreases. Since each carbon is bonded to multiple atoms, I just need to sum up each of the gains and losses to determine the oxidation number of that carbon. The first thing I'm going to do is examine the structure of urea. I know that the carbon is bonded to oxygen and the two amines, and since I know that oxygen likes to form four bonds, and that oxygen has nothing else bonded to it, it's going to form a double bond between carbon and oxygen. Between carbon and nitrogen, nitrogen is more electronegative, so that electron is lost, which means that the carbon so far has lost two electrons, and so the oxidation number increases by two. Oxygen is also more electronegative, and the fact that there's a double bond means it's stealing two electrons. Adding those up, my oxidation number for carbon on the reactant side is plus four. That means that answer choices A and B cannot be correct. On the product side, the carbon-containing compound is carbon dioxide. In carbon dioxide, there's only three atoms, so in order to fulfill bonding rules, I know that carbon is going to form double bonds to each of the oxygens. I'm going to apply the same rules I did earlier. Oxygen is more electronegative, so the carbon loses those electrons, and it's double loss with the double bond, so the oxidation number is plus two. The other side has the exact same setup. The carbon is going to lose two more electrons, bringing up my total oxidation number to plus four for the carbon and carbon dioxide, making C my correct answer. 